All right. I want you to see um, that it was a horrible, bitter time that was happening with them. And all hope had been lost for most of the Hebrews. When you're having your children in mass being thrown into the Nile River. To the Hebrew, when you said the Nile, that was just the river of death to them. But anyway, so let's get on with this. It says, now a man from the house or tribe of Levi went and married a a daughter of the house of Levi, and she conceived and she bore a son. But now here's the environment where all those children had to die. But it says that when she saw that he was beautiful, she hid him away for three months. You know, I remember the first time I saw Gabriel, my firstborn son. And I'm telling you, I know everyone may feel this way, but something was special about that kid. All my boys are special. All of them are uniquely special. I don't know if he was my firstborn son, but it was like supernatural. There's something different about this guy. And I remember in that moment when I first laid eyes on him, I would have done anything to maintain his life. I would have done anything. But I want you to see how God even works for the natural processes of life. In that this maternal instinct, and the maternal instinct gets a lot of downplay these days in modern society. But it is a wonderful, glorious thing. And in this case, it changed the world forever that you can be a mother, that you could have a heart totally bound to your children, that somehow they become everything, is not bad. It's not a form of societal oppression upon you. It's a wonderful, glorious thing. And the less we value children, the more we become like Pharaoh and the Egyptians. But this woman was willing to take this baby's life in exchange for her own because if this was found out, she surely would have died because she was going against what was considered to be the God of that nation. Pharaoh was seen as a God and it would be seen as almost blasphemy to go against his word. But so she hid him for three months. I don't know, I, I, I don't know how that's even possible. But I think God was involved with it. But it says when she could no longer hide him, And this is that moment where you see the desperation of a mother. And I look back on my life. I know the struggles that my own mother went through. My father died when I was 14, and it shattered her world. She became practically comatose for like a year. She would go to work, and then she would come back and just quietly lie in her bed until the next day to go to work. She was utterly shattered. It was like she was a shadow of who she once was. And when I think about when Jesus assigned that John would take care of his mother after he was gone, and I think about throughout the centuries, sometimes in the church I don't think we always acknowledge the pain and the suffering that goes along a lot of times with just being a mother. I know that I brought my mother all kinds of pain and suffering throughout the years. I don't know about the rest of you guys, but I certainly did. Maybe you guys are super holy guys. I don't know. Daniel, you're a super holy guy. Never brought your mom any pain. That's good. That's good. But I know, even for me as a man, it's hard for me to completely see what it is to be a person in this world. I've always been strong. I was always the biggest kid in my class. But whenever I talk to my wife about what it was to grow up, even not in the United States where we have a lot more protections for women, to grow up in Jamaica, to be the small one, to be the one who is weaker around a world of people who are all stronger than you, that is a difficult road to go through. And men don't always understand this. And that's why the scriptures talk about us having a love and a gentleness for women as the weaker vessel. It didn't mean that they were weak in their mind or their constitution. It meant that they must be protected. And that what is, and you know, these days people talk about toxic masculinity. No, the problem is, is that we don't have enough masculinity in this world. And here's the problem. People have assigned that the idea of a masculinity is equal to cruelty. And that's not what masculinity is. Masculinity is given to us from the image of God as the Father. He is a protector. 
He is concerned, and he's a guider, and he helps make sure that the weak are protected. That is masculinity, and I would love for us all to have a toxic level of that. And then we protect the femininity of women. But when we see here the most fragile situation where this woman knows that she's probably going to be dealing with the death of her child very soon. And I remember the desperation I felt when Joshua was basically dying the day that he was born. And there at three in the morning, after the nurses have finally just told me, they said, we just don't know, Mr. Green. I said, tell me the truth. What is going to happen to my child? Because they were all whispering off in the corner away from me. And I know that's not good because I saw everybody celebrating when my firstborn was, was born and now everybody's secretive off in a corner whispering. And so I go over there and I said, I need to know what is the condition of my son. And they let me know that I could be facing within a matter of hours the death of my son. And it was the darkest pit to be filled with. And I remember getting on my knees after they all left the room and I held little Joshua's hand and I just prayed, Jesus, don't let my son die. Woke up the next day, and there he is in Kim's arms, nursing. And I said, how long do we have with him? And she said, the rest of his life. I said, praise God, and we took him home. But this woman was facing this, the death of her child. But there was something special, and she went as far as she could go. And I want all of the women here to know that you may feel like you're restricted, and you try to go as far as you can for your children. And you try, and you put all your effort into it, and it seems like it's futile. And that's exactly how she felt, that this was a futile situation. But those efforts that you put forth towards the righteous things of God for the care of your children are not forgotten by the Spirit of God. They are amplified by the Spirit of God. And you don't know it all the time. There are things working behind the scenes. There are scenarios that you don't know are going to occur, that God will take the effort that you already put in, that he already put in your heart to do as part of the plan. And we don't know that it can change the whole world. And so even though you go through the pain and the emotional sense of loss, and what's going to go on here? Did I do everything right? Was I a bad mom? Did I do it okay? You have to trust that there's a God in heaven who is working all things according to good. And so what happens here is that it says that she got a basket for him and she covered it with tar and pitch. And then she took him and she put him in the basket and she technically, I guess, kind of fulfilled the command. She put him in the Nile. It says that she put him among the reeds and I believe that she put him among the reeds because the reeds might have some way of kind of protecting him from the current of the Nile River, which is a pretty huge raging river, and puts him in the reeds. That would kind of catch that, and he's technically in there. And I think that she's just hoping against hope. Now, I think it's this way as well. I think that she knew the command was for her to straight up dump him in the water. She went as far as she could go to keep the type of command, but trying to maintain him. And she knows now she has to let him go. And there comes a time when there just isn't any more that you can do. And she went as far as she could. And you know what I think she was thinking in the back of her head? I think she remembered the story of Noah. I don't know this, but I think that a good Jewish lady thought of the impossible was done through God with Noah. And I think in her mind she went back in the scriptures and just in some way she made a little ark for her little boy, hoping that maybe he would survive the flood that was his death. And she put him down there in the reeds, and she had to walk away, not knowing if the elements were going to kill him, if the animals would kill him, if the crocodiles would gobble him up. And I think that it notes there that the sister stays to watch. I think the mother's just thinking, I cannot bear this burden anymore. I've gone as far as I can. But the sister, who is almost a type of the Holy Spirit here is sitting there keeping an eye so that she can find out what happens to him. And then the providence of God works in here. And you know how it says that God will prepare a table before for you in the presence of who? According to Psalms 23? Your enemy. 
the table will be prepared and all the provision is there, but not in what seems like total safety. It's literally in the middle of what seems to be the most dangerous area. And so the very princess, who is the daughter of Pharaoh, who is supposed to support the whole thing about her father, comes up and it says that the daughter of Pharaoh, it says that she came down to bathe at the Nile with her maidens walking along the Nile. So it appears that she was probably bathing, but the, but the maidens were probably ready to uh, give her whatever service they needed to on the bank of the, of the river. And then it says that she sees the basket. And on top of that, she commands one of her maids to go get the basket and bring it to her. And this is where motherhood kicks in again and saves the day. You don't know who will come cross your child in the future. And it may even look like it's the absolute wrong person you want to come across the, the path of your child because I guarantee you uh, that, that uh, uh, Miriam, that's the name of a sister, right? It's Miriam. I guarantee you Miriam was scared to death when she saw that the daughter of Pharaoh was going to get hold of that child. She probably thought, this is the absolute death of my little baby brother. But it wasn't. God was preparing a table, all the provision in the very presence of the enemy of the Hebrews. And you've got to understand that God can work that way. What seems like total destruction and the end of all of your hope and all of your dreams that are bound up in that little kid. Because I guarantee you, all of you who had a little baby, no matter what seemed to come down the road later, when you looked into that perfect little baby, you dreamed of the hopes and dreams, what could be? And all that you would just hand to them if you could. And then that's about to be ripped away. And so what happens is this. God is working behind the scenes through the maternal instinct to be a mother. And so she opens up the basket and she sees the child and says, behold, he was crying. And the same effect that he had on his mom, he had on his second mom. And, and so he must not have been crying like, uh, like Isaac because I think she would have just pushed the basket down the, down the way because, ah! Something about this kid, the way he cried, reached into her heart and grabbed that maternal part of her and said, save me. You can do this. And so she even went against her own father in this. And all I can say is that she must have had a lot of sway. So you see the dynamic of family relationships all through this, that even he, because there ain't no way he's like, oh, you just happened to find this child. He knew what was up with this child. He had to. But somehow his love for his child was that sometimes you'll give your child, and I see this with a lot of wealthy persons, sometimes you just give that kid whatever they want. That sometimes that's how you parent as a wealthy person. Hey, you want this? You want that? Here, you can have it. Why? Because even though you're wealthy, it's all about you love that child. And I guess God turned his hate for the Hebrew children backwards on him and that through the love for his own child, he was willing to give her whatever she wanted which is the exact opposite of what he wanted. And so it says that she had pity on him. And, and she said, this must be one of the Hebrews' children. And so she's fully cognizant of the situation, that this is what's viewed as the enemy of my father. That is the power of the maternal instinct, that it can even win over divisions through ethnicity and culture. You know, there are people in America these days, we've had the history of racism go on in the United States. And constantly I'll be out like shopping, you know, and I got kids, you know. Nobody really, you know, they think, oh, they're white and black or something like that. Uh, honestly, my kids are part Chinese, part East Indian, uh, part African, part uh, uh, Cherokee, and part Irish. No one uh, thinks about it that way. And, and I'm thinking if one of them marries someone from Australia, I'll have all the continents in there. So maybe I need to send them to Australia or New Zealand or something like that. But anyway, so, but all the time, I'll see older people come up to me 
and they just want to play with my kids. They want to play with me. They act like they're theirs. I'm like, Dude, you can't just come up to my kid and do whatever you want with my kid. But what will happen is, and, and several of them will always say, well, I have a little grandson. And I know what they're fixing to say, and my grandson is mixed. And I think to myself, I'll be looking at this person, I'll say, I can see that they literally grew up in a time when that didn't happen. There was a time when you would have gotten angry that someone was sitting down in the bottom rows of the seats in the theater and that you needed to be sitting in that area or someone needed to use that bathroom and they needed to use that water fountain. There was a time like that that wasn't that long ago. It's before my time. Thank God I, I grew up in a very different world. I, things were pretty good for, for me. And I don't really experience a bunch of strange stuff in my situation at all. I, I don't know. Maybe Oklahoma's just great or something. I don't know. But what happens is I've seen that people from a totally different generation, through the birth of a child, somehow a unity comes through them. That They suddenly, even though this child may have been something that was the opposite of anything they wanted to do with when they were younger, and now it's their world. Something about children do that to us. And so Pharaoh's daughter is so moved by that capacity for maternal love that she is bound to him. And then the daughter who comes up in the opportune moment, almost like the Holy Spirit, to give a Holy Spirit suggestion into the situation. She says, shall I go get a woman to nurse for you from among the Hebrew women so that she may nurse him for you? Do you see her dropping it? That is a woman of opportunity. She's looking. She's smart. This was a genius woman. So she, right at the right moment, was able to push it just to the next level. Because we don't know what would have happened. She, may, you know, she was in that moment where she had to decide. She was in that key moment. But when she could see that there was no longer hate or anything like that in the eyes of the daughter of Pharaoh, that she could see that this little boy was having an effect on her, all of a sudden she steps in to be seen and goes, I got a good idea. Hey, why don't we go get a Hebrew nursemaid? She was sealing the deal. She was the salesman. And then it says that she said, go ahead. And she went and she called the child's mother. And then the daughter of Pharaoh said to her, she said, and imagine the turnaround of the fate. She thought that she had left her child to die. She thought that she had done everything that she could. And she was basically probably in the midst of mourning his death. And then all of a sudden she's brought forward and she sees him in the arms of the, the daughter of Pharaoh. And she doesn't know what this means. I'm sure the daughter's probably explained a little bit of it to her. And she says, will you take him away and nurse him? And I will give him your wages. I will give you your wages. And so on top of it, she was about to face the death of that child. And God twitch, switched it around to the point to where what actually happened is that now she is paid out of the coffers of Egypt to be a mother to her own child, while other children are going to their death. Death all around, all she could see. And she winds up, not just that, that the state is now raising that child that was trying to kill that child. The state literally was raising the one that would crush it. Think of that. The very savior of Israel they were financing his entire world. They were paying for him to be nursing off of his own mother. And then they would raise him to be educated inside of what at that time was probably the greatest schools on the planet. He probably knew calculus before the Greeks would know calculus. All these different things. He would become wise in their ways. He would learn what it is to, and, and this is not in the scriptures, but in Josephus, the Jewish historian, it appears that he grew up to be a mighty general who would fight wars for Egypt. He knew how to battle. He knew how to organize. He knew how to strategically do all these things. Matter of fact, he became such a powerful general, according to uh, Josephus, that when they went to war against Cush, against uh, Ethiopia, that the fame of who he was spread out so far that they just immediately just said, nope, here's what we're going to do. We got a beautiful daughter here. We're going to send her out to him and say, please don't kill us. Just marry this beautiful daughter. 
And so according to Josephus, he married her and gave mercy to all of the Ethiopians and brought them underneath the power of the Egyptians and then left and never returned back to her because it was a political marriage, kind of in the days of, Sol of Solomon. Now, whether or not we know that's really true, that's what it was handed down to Josephus. And then this man is the one who would turn and be the very hand of God to strike down hardly the wicked, wicked nation of Egypt. And they raised him up themselves. They fashioned the rope that would hang Pharaoh's neck. And eventually the day of reckoning would come through that very child. I don't know about you, but I'd say that was a big turnaround for the events of that mother's life. And it would change the world forever. And, but she would only have that short, precious time. And some of us don't have a lot of time with our child. And I'll close with this. When it says right here, it says that she went and nursed the child, and that can be a different length of time, you know, until a child is weaned. And he grew. And so basically, when he became weaned from the mother, she brought him back to the daughter of Pharaoh, and it says that he became her son. And she named him Moses because she drew him up out of the water. Now, I want to say this about Moses right here. Everything that you have heard just described to you is a foreshadow of the death of Jesus Christ. And a type of baptism that the Hebrews themselves would go through. And here's how I explain it right here. Moses was born a slave. He had to pass down into what was basically his death into the waters and go through a type of baptism where there were these moments where he had a mother and then he had nothing. All he had was a type of coffin that he lied in in the water. And then he was raised back up as royalty. No longer to live as a slave ever again. All things provided for him. Can you see it now? We will never abandon the Old Testament here. Because you will learn to love Jesus Christ and how God was planning all these things throughout the generations. And that's why you need to see this, that in your own baptism, the last baptism I did here, uh, I believe was Gabriel. Do you all remember what I said as I was putting him in the water? It was like Moses all over again, being put down into the water, buried with him in death and risen with him in newness of life. That is the whole symbol of baptism. And all the nation of Israel would be freed through the same type of baptism. They stood as Moses on the bank of the Red Sea. They were like little baby Moses on the Nile, certain death coming towards them. The entire army of Pharaoh once again bearing down on them. And they were all as one as Moses was when he was a baby, but about to go through a baptism of death. And as they stood there, that they would not survive. They were not soldiers, they were slaves. And the mightiest army on the planet heading their way. And then God parts the sea and they go through a type of baptism. And when they come out on the other side, they're no longer slaves, they are free. And that is the very image of Christ bringing us through his own death and then his resurrection to newness of life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.